What does it mean to be witness to unfathomable tragedy and have no real means to comprehend it or combat it? Why is it that my heart is more broken for one set of parents or orphans than another? Is there a limit on how much we can feel? Is there a limit in our capacity for, em for empathy and sympathy? I will be honest, it feels like the most real and logical thing. I believe that one can only absorb so much tragedy. We must, after all, for our own mental health, turn off the tragedy and turn toward our life if we are privileged enough to be experiencing it from afar. Whether an earthquake, a hurricane, a school shooting, terrorism, or war, if we are not personally in danger, we must and we do limit our exposure time and our emotional turmoil over other people's tragedies. But we also sometimes feel guilty about this. I feel privileged and guilty, and sometimes I wonder if I am responsible or could I do more to help. Sometimes I wonder, why is it that I care about that war in Europe, but not that war in Africa? Does that make me a racist? This is a fraction of the argument and second guessing I have had in my head this week. And it is lonely. Some people seem so sure. They see the, white, the world in black and white in secure terms. They do not question right or wrong or where their empathy should go. Some are unscathed. This tragedy is nothing to them. They have other concerns on their mind. And some people are celebrating murder, massacre, and terrorism. But I feel torn willing to fully condemn, but unsure about supporting the response. I feel torn, questioning why I care about that baby's murder, but cannot quite have the same sadness for that other baby's death. Are they not both babies? Are they not both innocent? Are they not both created in God's image and worthy of the breath of life? This has been my brain every day for the last two weeks. Every time I make a moral argument, I counter it in my head. I find I am jealous of the surety of others. Yet I also feel instinctively that they are wrong. I believe that sureness and right righteous vengeance and lack of hubris are dangerous qualities and I do not wish to emulate them. Righteous anger is in fact the sin of Sinat Chinam, the causation of the destruction of the temple and of Jerusalem in the year 70 of our common era. Our surety, not only were we right, but we had every justified reason to hate and distrust our neighbors, allowed the dissolution of our society and allowed the Roman Empire to murder and exile us. I feel guilty that I care at all for innocent Palestinians who have died and been made homeless in the Israeli air raids, and I feel guilty that I don't care as much about them as I ought to, or as about the thousands of Israelis who were made refugees in their own country, or whose whole families are called up to war, sending eight or ten of their grandchildren to the front at once. Making resettlement and supplies difficult because the truck driver, the grocery store worker, the gas station attendants have all joined the army. I care that my cousin's only answer to me when I ask about his family is, it's been a nightmare, too many funerals, so terribly tragic. But this, of course, is precisely why I care. It is not that I care for the innocent, it's not that I do not care for innocent Palestinians whose rights and hopes have been dashed by the terror organization that leads them. It is not that I am feel unfeeling for their babies and their grandmothers who have been killed because they are living as shields for Hamas headquarters 
or even been killed accidentally with a missed strike or die from the lack of medication and sanitation. I care about them, but I do not know them. My empathy is directly related to my connection to a place or a people. I care about Palestinian lives in the same way I care about any anonymous stranger struck by tragedy, be it natural or man-made. They are humans. They deserve my sympathy and support if I can manage it. But Israel is my home, my brothers, my family. One of the kibbutzim attacked the JFO teen tour and I were at just this past December, just 10 months ago. We stood at the peace fence on the border with Gaza as our guide explained how their children sleep in the family safe room and life is 90% paradise and 10% hell. I lived in Jerusalem for a year while the security wall was being built. During that year were the last three bus bombings in Jerusalem. I will send my kids to, on Israel tours. We plan and hope to be there this coming summer. I have colleagues and cousins who, even if they are distant, are still personal relations I know and I feel for. So if I left my, let myself off the hook, and I know that I can care for the innocent Palestinians, but understand why I feel more for the Israelis to the detriment of those innocent, where do I turn next? I have been reading and listening a lot to people I trust who I know have similar struggles as I. I've been learning a lot from the Shalom Hartman Institute and from the world of progressive Jews, which includes the Union for Reform Judaism, the Israel Movement for, for Progressive Judaism, the World Union for Progressive Judaism, and more. These organizations and the people in them, I know they struggle mightily with the direction of the Netanyahu government. I know they desire a two-state solution. I know they care deeply about humanity and do not wish to act on vengeance. And they have taught me to think about what is and how one can operate a just and moral war. Yehuda Kurtzner, president of the Shalom Hartman Institute, writes, just wars are not just because they are easy or victimless. Just wars are just because they are morally necessary, because pacifism in the face of an unfettered evil is an untenable moral position. Hamas has unleashed unfettered evil the alternative to war is to allow Hamas to continue to invade Israeli homes and murder and kidnap people from their own homes. No government and no army would allow this terrorism to happen without response. On October 8th or 9th, I asked myself and my friends, what is the purpose of an army if it is not to defend its citizens and go and get the ones kidnapped into enemy territory? No country would allow that. Responding on a war footing is moral, just, and necessary. But Kurtzner continues, the fact that this is a just war based on a just cause is no guarantee that it will be conducted justly. And this is where my bleeding heart comes in. What is the just way to conduct this war? How does one leave thousands of men, women, and children dead, injured, or displaced in a moral way? I have no answer. I know I am not an expert enough in the field of international law, war strategy, or even politics to begin to answer this question. I also know that there is a great danger in judging the way someone else balances the safety of their soldiers and citizens with that of the location they are invading. Monday morning quarterbacking is a guarantee of being righteous without taking any personal risk. I have none. My personal home was not attacked and my personal family is not in danger. What right do I have to question military tactics? And yet, just as I feel kinship to my Israeli brothers and sisters, so too do I know that the actions Israel takes will affect the entire worldwide Jewish population. 
I must balance my desire to leave the decisions to those most affected with my insistence that the Jewish army not be responsible for war crimes, genocide, or generalized revenge. Last year at a JFO Beit Midrash on Israel with Rabbi Yoni Dreyer and I, we strongly disagreed about, with each other about the nature and necessity of defense. We both agreed that Israel is in need of a defensive army, and we agreed that each citizen has the right to defend themselves and their home. But we disagreed on whether all actions of the IDF are indeed defensive. And we vehemently disagreed on whether there is a moral equivalence of an Israeli family defending itself to, sec to secure the safety of their children and a Palestinian family doing the same. I have strong disagreements with the actions of the Israeli government under Prime Minister Netanyahu. The government's actions for the future of Israeli democracy and the government's actions on the nature of defense compared to offensive military moves. I still do not believe, as I stated that night with Rabbi Dreyer, that I could personally kill another human, even to defend my own family. But my personal pacifism does not and should not prevent me from seeing moral need for Israel and the IDF to defend itself and its citizens following this horrible attack. I fear the nature of these defensive acts will not uphold the spirit of Sahal, the ethical rules of engagement the IDF teaches and swears by. But fearing an ethical breach is not an excuse to continue the status quo of terrorists at your doorsteps. I pray the Palestinian people will be liberated from Hamas so they may advocate for true peace and prosperity. I pray the IDF will conduct this war standing on their highest ethical principles despite the anguish experienced that leads to a desire for revenge. And I pray Israel's leaders will be swayed by the humanity, even as they are required to protect their citizens at the expense of others. May we someday know true peace in our homeland, peace for ourselves and for our neighbors, be they like us or unlike us. May we know that strength is not being the, successor, the successful warrior but is in overcoming our own evil inclinations. I do not know where my fin finite empathy will always land, and I will continue to struggle between questioning and surety. I will continue to second guess my empathy or lack thereof, but I pray as Rabbi Zohar's interfaith clergy group representing Jewish, Christian, Muslim, and Druze Israelis of the Upper Galilee pray, may we, cry out for a quick salvation for all those missing, for the immediate freedom of all the captives, and for the complete recovery of all the victims.